the habitat that birds occupy to help us identify them. Um, so their location, what, what, what it is that the space that they're occupying when you see them and where that's situated both in the habitat, the, the different types of trees that they're using and then where that's situated more in the landscape. So we're going to work through those ideas and, and talk about that. And then, so that'll be for about 40 minutes, all going well, and then we'll come back after we get grab a coffee and, and do our usual ID. And this week we're looking through um, three different groups of birds, the, the doves, the cuckoos, and some of the larger ground birds. Right, now, birds like other animals, but more so for birds, use habitat at four scales. Because they can fly around, they can really make a choice at the landscape scale. And th there's lots of good research on this now. You, you can look at how birds move across the landscape and what they land in and use and what they avoid. And they can make choices at quite a large scale, particularly some of the, the the birds that are prone to very big movements, hundreds if not thousands of kilometres. They can avoid a whole lot of the landscape and just zoom in on particular elements of it that they want to use. And that might be flying over all of their peninsula just to use beaches down along the south coast or it might be flying over air peninsula just to use the, um, the, the more forested areas down south but avoiding all the, the mallee and that sort of thing. So that first selection, that element of the landscape that they're occupying, that's the, the first choice that a lot of birds make. Then within that landscape, they then start to select the different associations of vegetation. So around this area, it, it might be sugar gum versus the EP blue gum and red gum along the creek lines. They might be selecting one over the other. Or it might be that they're selecting... Um, Mali or Casuarina um, associations independent of each other. So when they're selected within the landscape, they then have the ability to select the associations, the vegetation types that they're using. Then at the next scale, within those vegetation types, they often have areas that they occupy and they might occupy it for a, a couple of months well, they might occupy it for their entire life. And those areas that they occupy, we call home ranges. And a home range has a, a, a lot of proven advantages for an animal. If you know exactly where all the nooks and crannies are, if you know where all the branches are and how to fly through and down and over and around, then you've got a real advantage over another animal that, that is trying to chase you or catch you. Or you know where your food is. So you know where to go at particular times of the year. Or you know where the good, safe nesting habitat is. So there's that mistletoe down the back in the tree and that it's thick and dense and you can go and put your nest in there every year and the ravens won't find you. So those sort of choices animals are making all the time. Sometimes a home range, they will defend a part of it and they'll actively defend it. It might just be the five metres around their nest or it might be the entire area they occupy or it might be the three big eucalypts that give them most of the food most of the year. And for some species they'll just defend it against another male. For some they'll defend it against all the other in that one species. And for some like honey eaters and things like that they'll chase away anything that is able to be chased that's likely to use their source of nectar. So th there's different levels at which they become territorial. And there's different times. Some will just be territorial for a few months. Some will be just territorial for a week or two. Some will be territorial for the whole year. And they'll just chase whatever comes in there all the time. Then at the fourth scale, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, they're selecting the little elements of that habitat that they use. 
and that might be about where to go and get your food for that particular moment. It might be about um, your roost for the night, the refuge you use when it, it's, there's a threat around. There's a whole suite of things that each individual animal, and it's a localised choice, is occupying. They're, they're choosing particular micro elements of that range that they're living in. Okay, so four different levels. At the landscape scale, which part of Air Peninsula they're using, and then within that there'll be different veg associations. You know, are you using Calycteris pine forest or are you using uh, Alacasurina type of forest or is it Alacasurina forest that has a nice understory to it versus Alacasurina forest that just has grassy understory. Some species will prefer the grassy understory, others will prefer the stuff that's got acacias and other elements like that in it. Then within that area, which might be quite large, they'll have an area that's their own, that they occupy all year or for a breeding period or whatever. And at some stages they might defend it. And then within that area, they're staying there to use the different parts that, that provide what they need to stay alive. Okay? Four different levels. And when you get your book out, it's got to cover off on those four levels. And the first way it does that is with one of these maps. Now, where there's enough detail known, where there's, you've done enough surveys to actually say, I've never actually seen this species in this area, you can actually start to put holes in it. But usually it encompasses all of the observations of that species. And for, for some species there's enough detail known to say, for example, it doesn't go to the Nullarbor Plains. It's not up here in, in the northwest. So there are times where they can be really detailed about their knowledge of the landscape that a species occupies. Then there'll be a whole suite of patches within that that they don't occupy. And, and that'll be about which particular veg association they're choosing. Okay? But at this scale, if you're up here and you suddenly decide you're seeing a white fronted honey eater, then that's pretty unusual. Okay? If you're seeing a white fronted honey eater up there and you're writing it down on a record, you'd need to be able to take a whole lot of notes to justify that choice of that species being in that part of the world. If, on the other hand, you're seeing it in through here, more than likely it could be correct. So the first level that you've got to make a choice at is I, am I in the right landscape for this bird? And that might change. So here you've got a regular movement. At certain times of the year, the birds will move out into the um, Great Dividing Range and you'll see them there. At other times of the year, they won't be there. So think about that first stage. The next stage, they're talking about the habitat for you. And they're saying drier inland and coastal scrubs, heath, smog and mallee, blossoming shrubs, timber on watercourses, eucalypt woodlands. Now that's pretty broad in its scope. And that's telling you that within that, those landscapes, you're likely to find them fairly widespread. And white-fronted honeyeater, if it's flowering, they'll probably be there. That's, that's the type of bird in that drier country that will happily move all over the place chasing flowers. Then, down further, you've got the range and status. And that's going to summarise where the different subspecies are 
And it's also going to summarise how they move across the landscape at different times of the year, whether they migrate or not. So this guy, widespread across Australian mainland, west of the divide and south of tropical North Australia, which is sort of what you're seeing there. Um, that west of the divide, by the way, that's quite common for all sorts of species. So sleepy lizards don't go over the Great Dividing Range. <coughs> Obviously don't like Sydney. No, if, you, if, you're keeping, if you're keeping a sleepy lizard in Sydney, they often die of fungal associated diseases. They don't like that constant wet that you get for extended periods. So that, that region right through here is not good for them, whatever it is. Now, what's keeping the white fronted honey eater out of there? I don't know. It might be a simple thing like a skin disease. Who knows? But it doesn't like to cross that great divide. Okay, resident coastal WA. So you're likely to see them all year there. Broom, Perth, South Coast, Albany, WA through to the Coorong. They're also resident. Moves to coastal South Australia in summer, north to Kimberley and north coast in winter. So if you're up in this part of the world and you're seeing them in summer, that's unusual. Take a good note. Think about why. Generally, coastwoods in droughts, a blossom nomad migrant. So wherever there's flowering plants, they're moving through looking for those flowering plants. Locally common, I've seen 100 per hectare or more. Huge numbers in some places. If the flowers are there, the birds can be there. At times migrates in large numbers. What, yeah, yeah. Um, you know that um, uh, it's a Grevillea floria, florian? I uh, can't remember. You get them on the dunes up uh, near the Gammon Ranges, just this side. Oh, and uh, Gawler Ranges, sorry. And they, um, they, once they start flowering, they just fill the whole area up. They have a really distinctive metallic type call and it, it is just everywhere. <laughs> quite, quite amazing. Right, so with that sort of description, they're trying to cover off on those four levels. And sometimes with some birds, you, you'll just read that the particular microhabitats they use. So it might be that you only find them in Garnia phylum swamp lands and they're down low in that Garnia phylum. And, and that might be something like an emu wren. So they just like that particular habitat. They like the bushes all close together and they're not good at moving between gaps across gaps. So distribution maps, habitats and microhabitats, think about them. And then when you come to look at an area, start to think about all the habitats and microhabitats that you're getting across an area. So here's somewhere in the Adelaide Hills. You've got very large eucalypts with high canopy and it might be that you're looking at a thornbill. And in that part of the world, you'll have some species of thornbills that are always on the ground. You know, if you see them above a metre or two, that's really unusual. And also you'll have different species in that part of the world that will always be in the upper canopy. That's just where they are. And you won't see them down low. And if you're going to try to identify them, it's going to be with binoculars looking up high into the canopy, 20 or 30 metres, and it's tricky, unless you know the call or the fact that that species always stays high. That can be the key characteristic. Then within that canopy, there's a whole lot of habitats as well. So you can see all the mistletoes. Mistletoes are a really important part of a healthy community. Birds love mistletoes. They're thick, dense, they can put their nests in them and the chance of them being detected in there are really low. So that high frequency of nesting within mistletoes. They've also got lots of good food in them, whether it be the, the seed, the sticky seed with the pulp around it, or the flower, they're getting lots of good food from them. So mistletoes can be a key element of that upper canopy. And then there's all the bark layers. So that's one element with a whole lot of microhabitats 
but it's within something that has multiple layers of vegetation. So the next layer down you've got lots of acacias and things like that that are a couple of metres tall, two or three metres tall and, and that'll have a different suite of birds associated with it. And then you've got the, the next layer down which is the, that thicker ground layer that might be half a metre to a metre high, lots of little shrubby things. And different birds in different layers. So teasing apart all those microhabitats within each habitat and understanding which birds are where can be really useful. And if you're looking at something like Southern EP, there's particular types of habitat or veg associations, vegetation associations, that always have certain birds associated with them. And sometimes you've got particular species that tie in. And in the case of a sugar gum woodland, there's a couple of species that are, are really quite specific to them. So scarlet robins, not many of them on EP. Some people estimate probably about 60 or so, 30 pairs. And you, if you're going down to Winilla and get out to the Winilla uh, Park, you'll probably see a few of those pairs through there. Really neat. Um, the Western Dirigine, which is a, a funny little bird which is normally found out through the desert, but on EP, just down the southern part of EP, there's neat little populations associated with sugar gum woodlands and things like that. And then there's things like the yellow-tailed black cockatoo, which come down here to breed. And then about this time of the year, are heading up north. And that's west of Loch that they usually congregate and they'll spend uh, six or eight months up there. Six or so months. Gerigini? G R Y? Jerry Gone? But G R Y? G O N E. They have a really distinctive call. I was hoping to get them out there tonight, but we'll try and get to a few places where we'll hear them because they're, they're a lovely little bird with a very distinctive um, call that I can't imitate, so I won't. No, it won't interrupt too much. Um, <laughs> so this is the Lovely little call that. Sort of goes on and it never quite ends, but then it does. Anyway, you hear it on the EP. If you go to the Port Lincoln Golf Club, they for some reason like the pine trees there, so you'll hear them through there. Um, anyway, so Western Dirigini. And then another community that's quite neat on, on lower EP is that red gum, EP blue gum woodland. Now the EP blue gum is a community that's nationally endangered. It's got all sorts of threats to it. People call it the water gum in, in this part of the world. But it's tied to the creek lines and it's been hammered in all sorts of ways, uh, particularly the understory associated with it. But there's a few species that, that are often associated with it from whiteface, the pardal oats, but musk lorikeets, for example, like the, the, the beautiful big flowers that you get on those trees and, and they flower for quite a time, at a time of the year when a lot of other trees aren't flowering. 
So, sort of this autumn. Then things like the ridge fruited mallee shrublands. They have a, a suite of birds tied to them. Purple gate tunnyurda, which we saw briefly last week. Um, we saw the, the quite distinctive yellow markings and the black, but the purple gate, you need the sun on them to see that. Then things like the tawny crowned honey eater and, and um, the southern scrub robin. And southern scrub robins, um, they're, they're a bird that are declining in distribution, but we get a, a lot of them across EP in different habitats. So starting to think about different habitat types and the birds associated with them it is important. And then looking across EP, you're going from things like the, the river wet red gum woodlands that you get. Um, across here, South Australian blue gum and that sort of stuff. Heading up into the higher country where you, you get um, colitis pines and, and, and other um, plants associated with those drier habitats. That coastal habitat where you often get stuff tight around the coast and it's the only stuff left that they have farmed right up close to, to that but often you get the coastal habitat and particular species with that. But the stuff I really like to talk about and think about is more the dry land stuff in this part of the world. Now where you've got Mallee over Troodia, those Troodia, you, you, you know the way they grow and they grow out in a ring and and at a certain age they start to hollow out and die in the middle and so you get a, a lovely doughnut which keeps growing out. So very old triodia can be quite large. The habitat that that provides is really important for a whole suite of species. Lizards, mammals and, and birds also. So um, things like the short-tailed grass wren, which I found up in the Gawler Ranges, they, they love this sort of habitat but to get it so that it maintains the right species and gives the habitat they need, you've got to think about the way it's set up. So straight after a fire, very small and sparsely spread and, and not providing any habitat at all. And in those first 10 years after a fire or even up to 20 years, you don't get a whole lot of species using it. So you, you tend to get house mice and things like that rather than a lot of the native mammals. You still get the lizards but not as dense as they might be and a lot of the birds disappear out of it. And then for the next 30 or 40 years it's giving lots of good habitat to those species. But as it starts to hollow out in the middle the amount of ground that's covered in the trade drops off again. And so to keep the max of the bird involves having a lot of your triodia if you can in an area in the 20 to 50 year age bracket. So when we're doing burn offs through the different habitats across Air Peninsula, one of the key considerations is how much of the triodia is in that 20 to 50 year age bracket. We've got to have some that is burnt to be replacing it so that we burn now for 20 years down the track. And we've got to be thinking about what it is that's the proportions right across the region. Because if we have it all burning every five or ten years, then there's not much habitat for a whole bunch of species because it's just not giving them what they need. So they disappear out of the area. At the same time, with the mallees, to get them big enough and old enough so that they start to hollow out, it's at least 50 years before they start to be wide enough and have enough branches die off and the termites get in to, to hollow them out. Typically up to 100 years before that really good habitat is there. So another consideration is how much of the habitat is over 50 years as far as the mallee is concerned. We don't want to be burning our habitat every 20 or 30 years because in the end there's no hollows. And if there's no hollows, then we exclude a whole suite of species straight away. They're, they can't nest there, so they can't breed there, so they're not there. Greg, so habitat, when you're 
when the fire went through here 10 years ago, so what's that really done to convert population all through that? Like, uh, it's changed the understory a lot, but with, with the sugar gums, unlike the mallees, so things like sugar gums and that, you're getting growth from epicormic shoots. So you've got the trunk and all the way up the trunk under the bark are little points, which are growth points. And you see that when, when the tree is, health, um, is unhealthy and recovers after a drought or when, when you've had a fire or something and you suddenly get all that burst of growth along the trunk and those epicormic growths cover the tree. And, and so often in the case of the, the trees that reproduce or recover like that, they have the hollows maintained by the fires and, and that, that's good. But at the same time, you lose a lot of the canopy cover and, and it changes the density of the trees and, and so different species are advantaged and disadvantaged. But with the mallees, typically the whole thing burns and you get growth again from the, the stump. And that type of growth is what defines a mallee. So that growth, off you go. And with mallees, the, the diameter of the trunk is directly related to its time since fire, to its age. So if you've got a trunk that's this wide, you can actually create a graph that says how old the trees are. And so with mallees, they're starting out like this, and, and gradually over 50 years you finally get to a, a diameter that's giving you enough of a hollow that something like a paddle oak might use it. And so it goes on from there. So when we're burning across EP, we're thinking about two things with our mallee, for example. One of them is that we want to keep triodia in the 20 to 50 year age bracket. But there's a risk with that. If you just burn small areas, then things like roos come in and, and eat it all out. And triodia, when it's young, is soft and palatable. So you might lose your triodia for a while. Then the other part of it is, if you're putting a fire in to protect some old growth forest. So Hinks and Hambidge and places like that, Baskin Wells, typically every 30 or 40 years the whole thing burns. Which means that suddenly the whole area, 40, 50 kilometres by 20 or 30 kilometres, is no good for a whole suite of species unless the little bits hang on. But when, that, when those fires go north, south, east, west, you know, with the changing winds over weeks, that wipes out the whole area. So what we're trying to do with burns there is put a bit through the middle to stop east-west or crudely put a bit across the other middle to stop north-south burning the whole thing out. So that's, that's tricky but that's the objective. It's about the habitat that the different species need. So what would you achieve with the last burn? With Hinks, the aim was to stop those east-west burns, but in the end it's actually good. There has been, it, it's, it's like a Y, and so you've actually now got three separate habitats. The one that they were really wanting to protect, which is on that western side, that has now got good protection. So the worst case scenario there is that we get lightning strikes right in the middle of that um, old growth stuff on the west side, and yeah, that would muck it up. But it is isolated from... Reasonably happy with what happened. Yeah, it would have been... It didn't look good there for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it didn't, but the, the, that's the other challenge now. The, the thing that... And I don't know if you've seen programs on this. We're going from fires that might have burned for a day or two to fires that now burn for a week. And even though you could be patrolling the edge day after day, it just takes, and it might be a week later, one little bit of wind and off it goes again. And, and Yeah, particularly down south here where you've... Well, the question on that thing, Greg, what happens to all that habitat that far though, not south though? That resets it. So, yeah, it... it, it so for, you decide to me that that's a controlled burn, but in one way you're killing off species though. You're, you're killing off the, what's there standing now and, and any animals that are trapped in it, yes. But 
the, ar the argument has to be, do we put this fire through here yeah. to stop these all burning or do we just stand back and let it go and then burn all again and, and not get old enough to actually provide the habitat that a whole suite of species needs so they just disappear out of the area? So I would just go up and ask them what they you can put control burning in the park and go back all these stuff back there and use 10 years ago where it's say 100,000 acres just wiped out. Yep. So those birds, those well, in the case of emu wrens, yeah. there are particular areas that they're just gone and, and the likelihood of them getting back is really low because they just won't cover big open areas that we have through our paddocks now. So that, that, that's a real challenge. At the same time, it resets a whole lot of succession. So wattles and that that people were regarding as rare or you know seldom ever seen were suddenly abundant everywhere again so that sort of food source became available and other species would take advantage of that so coming up with an ecological understanding of it all is not easy and and making sure that all species get what they need is a real challenge so to give another example um, you, you've got western whipbirds down in the the um, to lower parks and, and they need particular fire frequencies. So too frequent a fire and they disappear from an area, too infrequent a fire and they disappear from an area. So they need that 20 to sort of 10 to 30 year fire frequency. That gives them the habitat they need. Other parts of the park where the fires are more frequent or less frequent, you don't see them very much. Um, then you've, you've got um, Things like the emu wrens, where you you really, if you're going to start burning in an area, you've got to be very careful about what's going on and how they can connect up and whether they can recover and move back into that that habitat. So that that's a really scary part of it. You don't want to impact on them. Yep. Emu wren? Oh, whip bird? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, then there are others that we're thinking about. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I have to think about um, But y you can see it's not an easy thing. And in the end, y y you're playing God in a way, you know? What, what do we let happen? And the other really big challenge in, in all our regions is over half of our natural habitat on Air Peninsula is not in parks. It's off parks. And how many fires do we get off parks? If, if we can avoid it, none. We, we know some do happen, like, like the Wangari fire, but on the whole, that hadn't burnt for, I don't know how long. How, how long's before it? A very long time. So that habitat was slowly changing over time. And is it important that there be a fire through it now and then? I don't know. A another challenge is something like the, the casuarinas, the she-oaks that are through that Talia country along the west side of, of uh, Air Peninsula. If you have fires, the sea, the, all the old ones die. The seed creates the new ones. If you've got a whole bunch of herbivores in the area, rabbits, mm -hmm. sheep, kangaroos, wombats, mm -hmm. then the combined effect of fire, herbivore, and then another fire and herbivore is that you lose them right out of the area. That's what happened back in the, the early 20th century. It was a combination of fires and herbivores, whether it be you know, overabundant rabbits or overabundant kangaroos or sheep, that led to the loss of a lot of that mm. habitat right along that west coast, yeah. which is why when you're driving to Elliston, it's just a cleared paddock. Mm. So mm. some farmers have, have done a lot of work there and as you get towards uh, Lake Hamilton, up on the right, you'll see a lot of she-oak through that country. They've 
closed off those paddocks for 10 years in order to achieve that outcome a couple of times over the last 30 years. And one of the things that natural resources like Natural Resource Air Peninsula do is pay them money to allow that to happen so that we do get some of that Shia country back. It's a real challenge. If you want to run it as a farm, you're going to lose your she-oaks because the sheep just eat all the regrowth. So making that work is tricky. Then you've got Mali with quite different understory. This is a kinopod understory. Uh, another kinopod shrubland, which is dominated by bluebush, Mariana setifolia. In this case, grazed and, and everything gets eaten out over those long dry periods. But then you get good rainfall and this just fills up with a whole bunch of different types of kinopods. And suddenly birds come from all over the place to occupy it. So you, you get your, um, your chats, your crimson chats and your orange chats and things like that come into the area and suddenly they're nesting. And, and that, that's how many Australian birds are adapted. They, they move to where the food source is. After the food source goes, they go and you might not see them for 10 years and then they're back again. One that I really love, the Western Mile country, where you've got a kinopod understory often, acacias and other things. Have you ever been to the Wayala Conservation Park, just north of Wayala? Beautiful part of the world. If you want to see some good birds, that, that's a very special part of the world. And where you've got the Western Mile, if you're heavily grazing it, they disappear out of the area. They need that respite in order to get above a certain height and then they're off again. But again, a habitat which in the dry years doesn't provide much food source or, or habitat at all for a whole bunch of species and then in the wet years off they go. Um, one that I particularly love, I got to do four surveys over four years out in this country, the Leary Plains to the west of the um, Gammon Ranges. And in really dry years, it's, it's basically just rock with little patches of veg now and then. But then you get the wet years and suddenly it takes off and we would get 20 or 30 species of birds and Lizards are always there because they can't move much, but not many animals at all. Then a couple of good years of rainfall, suddenly you're getting 70 or 80 species of birds. We were discovering mammals that have been thought extinct in South Australia for 50, 80, 100 years. And suddenly they've come out of little refuges that they've just persisted in for years and years beyond below detection levels because you'd have to put your trap right there to get them but suddenly boom and they're covering the whole region again. And that boom bust country is classically Australian <coughs> and it might be bust for 10, 20, 30, 50 years but then you get the good rainfalls and off it goes. Then you get the gullies tucked up in the really dry regions and the type of species you get there can be quite different. Um, so painted finches in, in those little gullies that come off the, the side of those mountain ranges and just one or two or three or four per gully. But beautiful little birds that particularly like that particular habitat. And you won't see them all around. You've just got to walk up the gully and there they are. And then ones that I really enjoy and have done a, a lot of work in are, are wetland systems. So this is Big Swamp, um, this is Lake Horden South down in big, um, southeast of South Australia, uh, Bull Lagoon down the southeast near Narracourt and these wetland systems are um, the lower lakes in the Murray. And those wet dry systems, they're really productive. If a wetland is wet all year and the water level doesn't change much, it's not very productive. You have a, a little zone around the outside where 
certain types of vegetation will grow, but on the whole, it, it, it's unable to produce a lot of habitat for a whole lot of species, and it doesn't produce huge amounts of food. But if it dries out, these chemical changes take place in the mud, you get growth in that mud area, and those grasses or whatever that grow in that area, they become a carbon source when, when the wetland floods. And the bacteria and the algae start on that, that source of immersed vegetation, and off it goes. And suddenly there's things feeding on bacteria, and suddenly there's things feeding on those, and then the birds are coming in, and boom. And a whole suite of species need that food source. And they'll move around Australia somehow, whether it's detection of the, um, the, very, high, the very low frequency sounds that come from thunderstorms and things like that, but somehow, suddenly a whole suite of birds will start moving to a big wetland in central Australia. And they get there as the waters get there. And that can be everything from um, uh, pelicans down through to uh, banded stilts or whatever. And they'll, they'll move there in their tens or hundreds of thousands and breed. These are, that's all fresh, fresh water. It salinizes, it dries out, yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, so yes. Fresh, <coughs> yep. Not salt, salt lakes. Salt lakes do the same sort of thing. Yeah. But not, they're, they're not as productive because you don't get the growth in it. But ones like this, Lake Horden South, it's about 15 kilometres long, four or five wide. If you want to get into where I am there, you have to walk through water this deep for about five to ten kilometres, depending on which side you come in from. <laughs> it, it's magnificent. And I, I highly recommend it. Get a pair of waders and go in. And there's little high points in that you can camp on. The mosquitoes would kill you. But when you get there, you've got to be able to push through the Garnier swamps and the Baumier swamps. And the <laughs> yeah. um, but when you get in there, I'm, I'm not joking, there'll be 10,000 dotrels and, and suddenly you, you get these vortexes of birds taking off with um, swamp harriers going through them. Just the most amazing sounds and, and it's a, a really dynamic part of the world. It's what a lot of the wetlands used to be like. So on the Murray River they used to talk about ducks taking off and the sun disappearing and things like that. Well, there are still some places where you can see that sort of diversity and abundance. And places like Lake Horden South are just phenomenal. You get in there to, to see tens of thousands of ducks and tens of thousands of all sorts of other birds and you get to see weird and wonderful things walking around through the shallow wetlands. Um, yeah, there's a lot of snakes. Weird people in waders. Weird people in waders, not very often, but they are there. It, and then surveying the fringing wetlands around um, places in the lower lakes. Again, you're walking through very deep water, you're walking through big reed beds, but you get to record a whole bunch of species that people don't often record. And this is, we were also flying over it now and then because there's big breeding colonies of ibis and you'll get tens of thousands of ibis at nesting sites so you can fly over and count them as you go. Okay, and then one to think about is that with edge habitats you get high diversity. So here <coughs> a wetland would normally flood up to this level in, in the wetter periods. This would stay wet for much longer. This is the Garnia, Garnia phyllum, so thick dense habitat where a particular species would be. And then over the back you've got the Melaleucas, the paper barks. At each of these edge zones You've got species from one habitat and species from other, and you see, so you see them both, but you also get species that specialise on the edges. So you might have 10 here, 10 there, and 5 that specialise on the edges. So if you're walking along the edge, you'll get 25 rather than 10 and 10. 
So start to think about where you walk, which is why it's probably good around the golf course, but um, if, if you're thinking about nice areas like Wanilla, um, the soldier settlement reserve just south of Wanilla, uh, th those sorts of places, if you start to think about where you walk, you'll see more species than if you just wander blindly. <coughs> then the next thing I'd like you to think about is what it is about the, the birds that are occupying the habitat that makes them want to occupy that habitat or able to occupy that habitat. So the way a bird flies is really important. It's dependent upon their wings. If you've got wing shapes that are specialised, then that excludes a whole bunch of habitats immediately. If, if it's a long, thin wing, it's wonderful for flying where there's wind. So you can have those winds, the roaring 40s and the screaming 50s that are whipping around the whole world. And an albatross can use the winds and and the way it comes off a wave to first of all fly across the wind to gain height and then to fall down into the wind, fly across the wind to gain height. And it, and it can do that right around the world for years and then come back and breed when it's about five years old. Now it's, it's very rarely flapping its wings. It's just able to use the lift. But it has a challenge. If it lands on the water, it takes a fair bit to get off the water. If it lands on land, it likes to land on a blowy edge of a fairly steep area that it can take off into and, and so fly away. Then you've got birds that are very fast and have particular wing designs that allow that. Then there's some that very short stubby wings, but they can fly straight up and down. So they can weave and move all through all sorts of habitats very quickly. So thinking about all those different sorts of wing shapes and what that means for the bird is really important. So the ones we're probably seeing most of are these guys. The aspect ratio, the length of the wing versus the width of the wing is quite low. Two to one, one to one but they can do a whole heap of things with that particular wing design. They can twist and turn very easily. They can manipulate the outer feathers in a way that allows them to do all sorts of things very quickly. And that, that ability to move through dense cover means that a dense tree canopy is just perfect for them. They can fly through that really quickly. And, and so that allows them to avoid a whole lot of threats. But it's good for a forest or it's good for a fairly closed woodland. But as you start to take a few of the trees out in between, the distance between the trees grow. And suddenly a bird that's really happy moving through and around has to fly rapidly from one tree to another. And it can't keep it up for long. So if you've taken trees that were 10 metres apart and you've spaced them out now by cutting some down so they're 50 or 100 metres apart, certain species will disappear out because in flying from this tree to that tree, they're exposed to predation or whatever. So changing the way they fly is not possible. They have wings that allow them to do certain things. If we change the habitat, then they disappear out of that habitat for whatever reason. Or they keep going because it's all good. Guys like this, relatively longer wing, but broad and nice and square at the end. And they can manipulate the feathers at the end. So this is really good where you've got nice thermals, hot air rising off the ground. Bird can fly along, catch onto the thermal, rise up with the thermal and then head off again. Just losing height as they go. Catch another thermal and head off again. That sort of ability to, to catch 
the rising air means that they can cover huge amounts of landscape very quickly, just working on picking up a particular food source that might be a bit sparser <coughs> as they're moving across. So the breadth of the wing, but more importantly, or as importantly, that ability to adjust the individual primaries out on the edge of the wing, very important. Then you've got the, the high speed birds, ones like this, move very quickly through the air. That wing design, they can fold the wings back. A lot of these can dive into the water, fold the wings right back. But that high speed manoeuvrable wing, like we saw in the um, Australian hobby that flew across tonight, highly adaptable and really fast. Um, so the wings are extremely flat. They're reasonably long, but they're narrow and triangular. So here's the wrist. L big, long primary feathers sticking out. And then very short secondaries. So when they fold up their wing, you're going to see big, long primaries right behind the tail, but the secondaries are very low. Okay. And birds like this, egrets and herons and whatever, really slow flapping flight that you can pick a mile away. They have a very um, curved wing and because of the way they fly, you can pick them from all sorts of distance. So you know it's an egret or a heron. Birds like this, not too good at flying through trees, but give them a, a windy area and that really high aspect ratio, that wing, you know, well over two metres across there, but quite narrow. So designed for flying across oceans with wind. Um, we used to call them jabiroos, but that's now a name reserved for the equivalent or very similar bird over in South America. So black-headed stork. Is that right? They're not jabiroos anymore. Well, not officially, but everyone else calls them jabiroos. I still call them jabiroos. I like the name. But their wings, again, designed for long distance gliding. They, they can move across big areas quite quickly. In Europe and that, where you get the big migrations of storks north-south down into Africa, you get to see the way they fly much more clearly. And another example, the, the hummingbirds, which have that amazing wing that allows them to do a figure eight. And so, like many of the insects, they can just sit in one place or move backwards, up, down, forward. And, and that allows them to feed in a very special way. But the speed with which their wings are moving, it's quite amazing. So you've got to be able to freeze something that's moving 50 times in, in a second or more, up and down. Quite phenomenal speeds of movement. And, and there, the way they rotate and bend at the shoulder, not at the wrists, is quite distinctive for them. Okay, I'll stop there. But start to think again about where a bird is and what makes it able to be there or like to be there or... What about the speed plumbers they let go in there, Doc? No, that speed plumbers didn't have a talk. What about speed plumbers go with... Um, Sure, yeah. From the um, just out of our. Uh, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, they got what's the name on them? What? Um, oh, grey plovers, the yeah, ones I sent yeah, the. Yeah. Well, I don't know where they're going. Well, <laughs> 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 they're going to 